Hello everyone. So welcome. Welcome to our last meetup this year. So in our continuous testing meetup online. So then let's start. So at first I want to say a big thank you to our sponsors, Source Lab Trending and to Amusement for helping us to organize the meetup, for paying the fees, for promoting the event. And Elsa, big thank you to Aurelian and Severin to be always here and to help in all, all things. So thank you. So then let's move forward. Uh, in case you passed our last meetup session, you can go to our website, continuoustestingmeetup.com and find the video recording there from the last, from the all last session. So just go there and check, check the videos. So what we have today, today we have Lukas. Lukas is joining us from Warsaw. He is a full stack developer at Coda Earth and he's going to present us his topic, I ship CSS as soon as the test passed and I'm not crazy. So thank you Lukas to come to us and the stage is yours. For all participants, please mute yourself in the time of, of talk. And in case you have burning questions, just put it in the Slack channel or here in the chat and ask them. Otherwise, please wait until the end of the talk and you will have the possibility to ask all your questions after it. So thank you, uh, Lukas, the stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. So as you have already seen, I do weird things. I ship CSS as soon as the tests pass. And I'm not crazy because I like to think of myself that I'm actually Ukash. And I've been a professional software developer for over eight years. And I have a confession to make because I still make mistakes, plenty of mistakes. And I had a moment in my life when I wanted to stop making mistakes takes and do everything perfect the first time, but I didn't manage and I decided to change the direction. So I found a way to live with it. Of course, I don't want to do some poor job. I want to be proud of the things I ship. So how do I do it? Well, I tried to do it with tests. And tonight I will share with you the story of how I got there what worked for me and what was a challenge. So my goal was to feel safe and powerful. I wanted to be confident in my ability to deliver working software. And I wanted to be creative. I wanted to build new things. I wanted to focus on some features that could make people smile. And I thought that maybe, just maybe a good way to get there would be to have tests good enough, not perfect, good enough so that I can just ship the code if they pass. Like a good buddy, hey, is it okay? And they say, yeah, that's right. I wanted my tests to be like that. So of course, there are various reasons to write them. You might want to measure performance, do some property testing to discover some things you couldn't even predict. You might want to foster communication with some nicely written Gherkin scenarios. You might want to monitor for security issues. Maybe you feel social pressure to write the tests. Maybe you just want to be able to run your app quickly thanks to the test runner. But to me, to achieve my goals of feeling powerful and calm, I wanted to be able to spot regression. And for that, I just had to have some example-based testing. Hey, here is what I expected to be. Here is what you should run and tell me if that's still okay. So backend was easy. I started my career as a backend developer and I got comfortable with writing that kind of tests because I was just executing some code, be it some HTTP request or maybe some function call or some class method didn't matter. I was just executing some piece of code, getting some response, some data structure, and I was able to compare it because I was able to write, okay, I want this data structure to look like this. I want this property result to be minus two. If it is five and 
let's say minus five and seven, and it's negative, yes, it is negative, simple. Just a very narrow scope, very little to compare against. But that was good. The tests were passing, I was shipping it. But then I became a front-end developer and I started building single-page applications. I started writing CSS, JS, and the tests. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that simple anymore, like when I was writing some functions and APIs, because I had async stuff, like five things going on in the same time and rendering some layouts, spacing and charts with some bars of different colors. Sometimes they were like changing dimensions based on some sliders. There were dialogues popping on the screen. And I was like, holy crap, what should I do with it? So I tried what I already knew. I read about what was then the state of the art or at least what I found. And yeah, I wanted to be able to do the same thing. Like the tests are passing, yeah, ship it. But the truth was that I had to fix the test and then test it, to really test it manually. Because even though there were some frameworks, libraries, ideas, protocols, when I was trying these things, it didn't click. I was always facing that sad reality that I was testing my stuff manually. So I was writing my code, I was writing my tests, I was running them, making sure they are green. And then before pushing the code to the central repository, I was testing it manually. So I tried to identify some ingredients, something that makes a good test and see if I missed something or maybe I picked the wrong solution. Maybe I just didn't see some mistakes. So I tried to take a step back and I knew that I had to have a way to interact with my system. So when I was a backend developer, I was calling endpoints. I was triggering functions. So probably I have to do something similar now. I also had a way to, I, I had to have a way to compare against some desired outcome. So I somehow had to have a permanent description. This is what I want. Please tell me if my app still behaves that way. And of course, like always with tests, when we are writing example-based tests, when we have very strict examples of the desired outcome, we have to control all the moving pieces because if the API changes or maybe if the screen size changes or if anything of that kind changes, the outcome changes and we cannot compare it. And I found it to be true for endpoints, through functions, as well as entire single page applications. So I started with interacting with the system and I found out that that was easy because we had Selenium, we had good web browsers. So that's good. I can pick a Google Chrome because my app is supposed to run in a web browser. Like my code is supposed to run, let's say on a node or in some SQL database. So a single page application is supposed to run in a browser. I'm gonna run it in a browser and I'm not gonna overthink it. And then if I run it, I probably want to interact with it because just running it wouldn't be fun. So I thought maybe a good battle tested protocol would be something that I wanna use. So I just picked Selenium because it implements this web driver protocol, which is a W. 3C recommendation and it seemed solid, as in it didn't change that often. It was bugged by plenty of people, but the, the API was a bit clunky. Like the low level API, it wasn't comfortable to me. The selectors weren't something I was familiar with. So I just sprinkled on top this wonderful library by Ken C. Dodds, which is called Testing Library. 
Some of you might remember it from React testing library. And it gives you that nice set of selectors, which are very much like what the user would do. For example, you can look for an element with the role button that has a label that matches to some particular regular expression. So instead of finding like the third element or any element with some text, you can look for buttons, inputs, and so on. You can match it against labels, text content, some names. So exactly what the user would do instead of just matching against some artificial test IDs that the user doesn't see. So I liked it because it was natural. I didn't have to think too much. So I liked it, of course. And also it was a tiny bit of accessibility testing. I was able to check if that button was a button for sure, or if that text field was a text field and not just some content editable without any properties. And that wasn't my, my main focus to test accessibility, but it was almost free. So I picked it. And that's how it looked in the code. I was opening a browser, finding something using testing library and interacting with it. Exactly like the user would do, just get into the browser, run the app, find a button like this, click it. And when I was running my tests, I was able to see something like this, which is very much my web browser. That's with a little message saying that it is actually being controlled by some automation software. But it's exactly my browser, my app, and my machine. So that was the first part, interaction with the system. But what about comparing it with what I wanted? What about comparison against the desired results? Well, that part was tricky. Because I was a backend developer, I was familiar with some objects and comparing objects. So I started with something like this. For example, when I wanted to check how thick was the font or very much anything else I tried to use for anything because that was everything I knew. You know, like if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if all you have is a tool to check objects, you are going to check objects. That's what I did. So I was getting my element object, reading its style, reading its font weight property, and seeing whether it equals to bold. And it seemed good at the first glance to me, just entering the world of web applications running in the browser. But yeah, it had some issues. So why did I write it? What was the point? Let's say that my app looked like this. It had this bold text. And I wanted to make sure that nothing bad happens to it, that this text stays that way. It's nice and bold, and I wanted it like that. So I expected my tests to fail when it was getting thin or distorted in some way. But let's focus on just getting too thin. When the font is like 400 thick, it's less than 700, which is bold. It looks wrong. I expect my tests to fail and tell me, hey, you did something wrong. It was supposed to be bold. And that was my desire so that I can move for faster. I could be confident that my app is not broken. But I didn't get that result because if I just refactored that little one parameter to 700 instead of bold, it was crashing. The test was failing. The test wasn't passing because it wasn't equal to bold. 700 means the same in CSS as bold, but my test was saying like, oh, no, 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 that's something wrong. It has changed. You must look at it. It must be broken. And I realized it was, it was wrong because what I was doing, I was just getting some tool I knew and without looking, putting it somewhere where I wanted it to be. 
and I wasn't checking the result of running my function because my function was something that renders text on the screen. I wasn't interested in writing a code writing machine. So I didn't care whether it was bold, 400 or 700. What I cared about was whether it looked like that. So if some of you are familiar with um, tabs versus spaces, and what backend developers or developers of any sort like to argue about. Imagine if there was an automated test that instead of checking what is the re result of calling add one and two, instead of checking whether it's three, it was checking if the function consists of tabs inside the source code. Well, yeah, part of me, a part of me wants to do it. <laughs> I, I must admit it would be funny, but it wouldn't be useful because it doesn't matter. Our clients don't care about it, at least mine didn't. So I wanted to check the results of running my code. And that's just one line of CSS while I was writing hundreds of them and even more lines of HTML and similar markdown. So what I did was, okay, I have to take a step back again and look at the results. And my results were pixels. Okay, so I took pixels. And when I wanted to check a rectangle, which was like three by three, I could check the first pixel to be red and then the second one and so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. And that particular test case, is perfect if you want to make sure that you have a red rectangle with a black square in the middle and it is exactly three by three pixels big. And that was a good direction, I believe. It was good that I started working with pixels. However, my method was broken because even though I was finally checking the real results of running my code, I was making tests about some something that my clients understand, see, care about, want. Well, that doesn't scale because a 4K screen is like 8 million pixels. And uh, yeah, I usually write apps that are bigger than three by three pixels. And yeah, I'm not crazy. So that didn't scale. I had to find something else to work with my pixels. And fortunately, there is some idea that I stumbled upon. It was um, snapshots by Facebook, but American Express extended it with images. And basically what they did was together creating some infrastructure that allowed me to answer one very important question. Does this look the same? So what do I mean by this? If inside my test, I wrote something like this, screenshot take, gave it some name, let's say submitted, just this, nothing more. That's all my test code. What it does is that when I first run the test and I suppose that I'm writing the test, that I'm looking at the screen, I might be writing the app as I'm writing the test. Well, I'm sitting in front of the computer, I'm observing it. So I see something on my screen. It's being per um, persisted on my disk as a screenshot. So it takes a screenshot, it saves it, and per it persists it on my disk. And when I run that test again, it checks if that app still looks the same because that's the outcome of my code, of my HTML and CSS. It is how it looks, not what is the syntax of it. Of course, it is important that I can click a button, but I'm already covering it with testing library. So when it comes to all that visual stuff, all of that renders, it is important that I take a screenshot and compare it with the previous screenshot. And I don't have to paint it because when I was a backend developer, when I was writing 
hey, I expect this object to be that. I was usually writing it from scratch, this perfect example of this desired outcome. But here I cannot paint 8 million pixels in any kind of editor, that's not feasible. So I just take a screenshot or actually that library takes it from me and I can look at it. I can say, it's okay. I could put it away. And then as soon as it changes, as soon as my app starts rendering something else, it's gonna show me a diff. On the left, you can see, okay, that's how it looked. On the right is how it looks. And in the middle, there is a handy diff highlight. So I can see exactly what parts changed because they are highlighted. In that case, you can see that it is about this extra item here. And of course, there's a shadow. So it also moved a little bit of that part changed. And I can say it's totally fine. I like it, it's desired. So I can save it and accept it. And then that the right part becomes the new normal. And that's fine. Or I can say, okay, I see, thanks. Uh, it wasn't what I wanted, it's a bug. So maybe I wanna fix it and then I can run the tests. If it looks like it looked before, it's gonna pass. So I already had my comparison against the desired result, but as some of you might already be wondering, like, does it work? Because if we add one row to a table, it's gonna crash, right? Yep, it's gonna crash. It's gonna be a, an alarm and it's not gonna be a false alarm because we expect it to look exactly the same. So I have to control all of the moving pieces. And when I write single page applications and when I test them, they are well big JavaScript applications that render some components and they also fetch some data. And I have to make sure that this data is exactly the same every time and that even sometimes it has to arrive at the particular moment. Because for example, I wanna take a screenshot of the page that says, okay, your data is almost there. We are still waiting. It will be in five seconds, whatever. I want to be able to test my spinners, progress bars, that kind of stuff. So I have to control my backend. And that becomes a bit tricky, but my backend expertise helped here because it is again mocking objects. So here we have some requests, get to do's, and it is supposed to return these two to do items. It is a very simple example, and so is that mock. Of course, there can be some other useful example, like what happens when we add a to do item? That to do item appears at the top of the list, and it is the same kind of request, exactly the same request as before, just now we have one extra item. We might want to test our app to see how it behaves when, for example, we first fetch some list after we open the app, then we do something. For example, we post a new item or we delete some item. And what happens when that app fetches again that list or when? And does it fetch it again? So we might need to sometimes have a really almost realistic, almost like real life mock that behaves exactly the same way a real server would behave. But of course, I didn't want to implement some backend twice, especially when I wasn't a backend developer. So what to do, how to transition from one place to another in a way that is good for lazy people like me. Well, I would just write an example. And that's another example. Hey, I want this post request to change this get to do's to that get to do's. And it's still kind of wishful thinking, but actually some idea called state charts, which is a visual paradigm to model complex systems. That comes in handy because how we can apply it here? Well. Just define scenarios. Let's say we are adding items. It's all in the same bag. We're just throwing 
these three requests to one bag. And then we say that, okay, at the start point, we have this. Also at the start point, we have this, this pause request, but it actually transitions this whole scenario to the added state. And while we are in this added state, it returns a different response to the same request. So it is like connecting boxes with some arrows, and this is one get, another get, and that transition, how it changes from this one to the another one, it is through this post request. So this is like that trigger what pushes it to change. And it's like writing examples of that API. I don't have to write any loops, any databases, uh, nothing like this. I just write a couple of JSON files and it behaves like a real server. So now when I had these three pieces, I had my lovely Selenium with testing library. I also had the test framework, which was just from Facebook together with image snapshots from American Express, lovely stuff. I had these mocks based on state charts, all in JSON. So what to do with it? Well, of course, my test framework is going to communicate with the browser. It's gonna open it. It's gonna click some buttons. And that app, it's also gonna talk to some mock because I don't want it to talk to the real server because I cannot predict what is it going to return or when is it going to return something. I want to have total control over everything. And to do so, I have to have one more communication channel between my test framework and my mocks because everything has to work together. Otherwise, from my experience, it was crushing. And what do I mean by the test framework working with the mock server? Take a look at this yellow arrow. It says that release on finish adding. And, and it means that this particular response to this post request isn't going to be just released by, the, by that mock server. It's gonna wait. If we just call the server, it's gonna return nothing. It will just hang there. And why? Why do we do it? So that in my test, I can do something like this. I can take a screenshot, let's say submitting. When I click a button and it starts submitting a form, sends a post request, this post request takes some time. So maybe the button is inactive or maybe I see uh, some message like updating, uploading, whatever. I wanna test it, so I take a screenshot. And to be able to take a screenshot before it finishes, especially that it's all running on my laptop, so it's fast because I don't have to wait for a network connection to another city or country. I have to pause it. I have to wait before returning that response. So that's why I do something like this here to link it with my test. And when I am already in my test, when the test I really took the screenshot, compare it, it's all okay. I can just instruct it to, okay, release that post request. And that's how then I can take another screenshot which already has access to that response from that post request. And that's crucial to have that correct timing because if I did just wait 500 milliseconds, I did it in the past and you know what? Sometimes it worked. Sometimes it was good enough, especially when the number was big, like wait. 500 milliseconds was kind of too short, maybe a couple of seconds. And if I had to test something when that request was still ongoing, that was better than nothing. However, I had tons of issues with it because it wasn't predictable. Sometimes the machine was under some heavy load. Sometimes that app wasn't ready yet. So it was just guessing and usually I was just erring on the side of big numbers, like five seconds. So most of the time when I was running my automated tests, they were waiting 
and waiting and waiting and doing nothing. It was good when there were just a couple of them, but it didn't scale. So I wanted to bring it closer together. And for that, I needed the synchronization. I couldn't just wait for two things all apart by many seconds. I wanted to synchronize it like, okay, do it now, post it, take a screenshot, release the post, take a screenshot and continue. So that's why I wrote the synchronization mechanism. And to sum it up, the ingredients I found to be necessary if I wanted to have a test were as follows. I had to have an environment where I could really, really run that app. So I was trying some virtual DOM, some other virtual browsers, and I don't mean headless browsers, but like simulated browsers. And it was something interesting for some particular purposes, but not for me, because I was building an entire app and it was always CSS heavy, especially since I became a front-end developer. So I just wanted to run it where that app was supposed to run. So in a web browser, and I used Selenium to drive it. And because even though Selenium was great, when I was using the low level APIs, I had no issues with it. It wasn't pleasant and it was kind of hard to get right because I don't want to blame Selenium for my mistakes where I wasn't able to use it properly. So I wanted to find a nice friendly API. So I picked that testing library from Kensi Dots just because I was exposed to it a lot, but it turned out to be actually kind of useful because it was also testing the app, interacting with that app in the same way how a real user would. So it was using labels, text values of buttons and so on. And to actually have any value from those tests because I wasn't just you know sitting in front of my computer watching it execute scenarios. I wanted it to be done automatically and I didn't want to put any effort in it. I had to have a way to compare it against the desired outcome. So I picked that American Express image snapshot package and yeah, it's great. I had to do some configuration and um, it wasn't working perfectly from the get go. So it took some fine tuning, but once I got it, it was just working very well. And of course, because my apps were often something more than just CSS, I had some APIs, I had some logic around that. I didn't want to test some implementation details. I didn't want to spy on my app to make sure that it does exactly some very precise thing. I just wanted to give it a mock that looked like a real server and see if it works. I did it the same when I was a backend developer. I was mocking at some I mean, as little as possible. And as I wanted to keep it as realistic as possible because after all, nobody cares how my code runs in some fake environment. So if I have to fake something, I want it to be almost, almost identical as the real thing. And to make all of that work, I had to use some synchronization mechanism, for example, between mocks and tests. And here I used again, the state charts and the communication between mocks and tests to say, hey, mocks, now return this thing to the app so I can do some more work because I have already finished my work. All of these pieces, they must work together. Otherwise, when I was just relying on some delays like five seconds or one second or whatever, it was sometimes working, sometimes not, it wasn't reliable. And of course, it took a lot of glue to put these things together. It's um, mostly like NPM install commands and hundreds, if not thousands of lines of some glue code. So what does it do? Because I had these little separate frameworks, libraries, protocols, ideas, and when I put them together in a package, it is a solution that helps me achieve my goals. And I prepared a little video 
that uh, walks you through me building a simple feature. So let's watch this video. It was originally like half of an hour long. So I got this idea, hey, maybe I'm gonna speed it up 10 times and just put some labels. Let's see how it works. So here's that app and you can toggle some items, but you cannot add anything. All right, so I would like to do it well. I would like to implement this feature in the same way I was doing it before for my clients with that library or with some similar setup I was doing just at hog. So I'm gonna install a package and configure it by just copying and pasting it from the documentation. Nothing custom here. And now when I'm writing my new test, after doing npm install and a couple of copy paste commands, I'm gonna do the same. I'm just gonna copy paste it because I'm not doing anything that would be so unique. So yeah, I copy pasted uh, an example test. It's not exactly what I wanted, but it's close enough. And now I'm gonna get some mocks. I actually had an example for a to-do app. It's not that to-do app, but it roughly looks Okay, there is something so I can work with it and I'm gonna run it. So what do I get? I get a browser and here's my app. Of course, it doesn't do anything because it doesn't get anything to understand. The models are wrong. The test case is empty. It just pops up with the browser, but it's already something, something works, something appears on the screen. So yeah, it failed to fetch data, but it exists. I can see that the app was trying to do some get request to that particular address, but nothing was mocked. Okay, so what can I do about it? Because that app already existed. It didn't have any tests. So it is like a very live, realistic scenario when you face an app that exists partially Maybe it's like partially written, but not tested at all. So I'm gonna just run this test, pause it and see what I actually get. I mean, first I'm gonna see the real app. So here's the real app and it already fetches something from that real backend. I'm gonna copy it, the whole thing. And I'm gonna put it in my mock. So now I'm gonna get the proper data from my mocked server. So let's run it again. Okay, now that's my test environment and it's already fetching some data, which is identical to what I had from the real API. And I took it because it was just a good example. Okay, but we are not doing here a test of fetching data. So we have to continue. And by continuing, I mean posting some data because I want to implement that feature which is missing. And I want to somehow post. And yeah, I didn't remember how I named the items here. And oh, by the way, that's a vanilla JS app. So I didn't use any frameworks. That's just an example, pure JS. Um, it's not really that important if it's any framework or not a framework. So I'm gonna copy my IDs and I'm just doing some developer work here, bringing IDs together and I'm gonna write an even handler for it. Okay, so now I have some code that uh, reads data. Okay, so let's, let's run it, it's cheap. It's cheap to run it and I can open some console or whatever. I can see if it disables something, how it looks. It looks okay. So I'm gonna now write a test for it. I mean, I'm gonna automate filling in the form because now I just clicked it manually and it was okay. It was what I wanted. So I'm gonna write it down and yeah, just copy pasting stuff. And here's, it's done very much. So I took a screenshot when it loaded, then I found that label uh, for that text input, actually a placeholder. I wrote something, I clicked the button to add it, and I'm gonna take a screenshot. And let's see how it works. 
All right, so it wrote it automatically. Click the red button and it took a screenshot. So that looks fine. The first step when uh, that app is just loaded. Well, the submitted part also kind of looks okay because it's submitted and it's a good start. So let's continue because it's not doing anything. So maybe now I could continue the implementation and actually make it post the data. And yeah, I didn't exactly remember how to do it. So I just console logged it. Uh, I could use a debugger, but for such a simple case, I don't really have to. And I am, I'm gonna pause the test to see if it works because it's cheap to alternate between the code and the test. It's very much as if I was switching between my editor and some real app or some development server of some app. So I can just open the test and I can see the console inside of the browser, which is controlled by Selenium. And I can confirm that I actually read it correctly in my JavaScript code. And I continue, okay, that's fine. So let's make a request to some API. And you can see that, uh, yeah, it's just a regular fetch request, exactly uh, how a real app would do it against a real server. It's just that this part is gonna be changed in that testing environment. So yeah, let's run it again. And um, yeah, it posted, but we can see in the console here that there was no mock for that particular request. Okay, nothing listens for my post. So let's write my mock if the error is telling me to, to do it. So I basically wrote it against the rules. I'm according to the rules from some slides before and I'm running it again. Yeah, I'm just copy pasting from documentation. And let's see how the app behaves. Okay, it behaves very much the same because I didn't do anything more except for posting, but I'm really doing it very often, like writing five lines of code or less, running tests, seeing if it breaks. Okay, so now maybe after sending that request, if all the mocks are actually returning data, my mocking server doesn't complain about some unmatched requests, the browser doesn't crash, the screenshots look the same. So let's now refresh the screen after I posted it. All right, I'm gonna run it. And we have a test failure. And why is that? So let's see. Here's a diff. And that's how it looked before. So here, before I had two items and now I can see I have three items, there's a difference. And yeah, the difference is because I actually refreshed it. So that's something I wanted to do. And my screenshot was reflecting some unfinished state. So I'm gonna accept it. I think it's okay. I'm gonna use uh, that update function from Facebook suggest. And it's gonna say basically, hey, that's okay. Cupid has that ideal state. So now we can see that if it's submitted, we see already three items. Okay, but that's not ready yet because that thing shouldn't be gray anymore and maybe it should be gray, but before, so let's uh, finish the implementation. Let's uh, also test the state before it's finished. So now I have to do that synchronization as I showed you before. So I want to wait with releasing the response to my post request so that I can take a screenshot of the loading state or the posting state and only then continue to when it's posted. And of course, I'm going to copy paste it from the documentation because even though I wrote it, I don't remember it. And um, yeah, I'm going to call it finish adding. And in my test before I take a screenshot, on it, then I will release it. And yeah, uh, now it finishes only when we ask it to do so. And that's why there was a crash because it didn't look exactly like it looked before. Oh, sorry, not that direction. Yeah, uh, now it didn't appear. 
because it wasn't released. So let's work with it. Let's uh, make sure it looks like I wanted it to look. So now I have two screenshots when there's something going on. I have one when it's submitting, then I'm asking the mock to release my response, and then I'm taking another screenshot. So let's see it now. Okay, we see that it's been submitted. We have a new one, but the app is not ready yet because it stays gray. And of course, the, the mock doesn't know it. The test doesn't know it. So it's up to me because when I'm developing it, I can look at it because it's on my screen and I can judge it. Is it correct or not? I know it's not finished yet. So let me just make it nice again. Let me, let me dis, um, disable that disabled state. So let me make it enabled. And we can run it again. All right, it failed because it wasn't exactly the same. And yeah, we can check it that now it's nice and ready, active again, the same as the bottom. Here, the text is also different. And so it's good. So I'm gonna save it again as that good desired example. And I removed that test posing and the test is ready. That's very much it. So I'm taking a screenshot when it's loaded, I'm writing something, clicking a button, taking a screenshot, releasing some API, taking a screenshot, that's all the kind of assertions I'm gonna use here. And let me just have a quick look at the chat. Oh yeah, that, yes, thank you very much for answering that question for me. I did use um, this mocking tool. There is going to be a link at the end so you could access all the tools I use, the Facebook chess, image snapshot from American Express and so on. So now I'm gonna do some funny stuff. I had some CSS, which was saying 700. So I'm gonna change it to bold and see what happens on green because the app still looks the same. The code changed. So my old front end test would say something like, no, 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 that's wrong. It's, it's broken, but it's not broken. It's refactored and I can do anything I want as long as the, the app behaves the same way. So I could actually rewrite it in some framework, like I could write it in React and use some different styling solution. It doesn't matter. If it was the same from the perspective of a real user, the tests will still pass. So let's see 400, maybe the tests are always green. So it's always a good idea to make sure that they sometimes fail when they should have. Okay, and now, yeah, there is an error. And we can see that it looks wrong. Okay. So I don't want it, I, I don't like it. I'm gonna change the code so it looks the same again. And my tests are green. So they're really checking the outcome. And also there is something about the freedom to do anything you want in the code because Maybe that was a good code, maybe it wasn't. So let's just try to, for the sake of experimenting with it, write it in a different way. So this is an async function. And let's say that we are going to rewrite it to a function that doesn't use any async await. I'm gonna remove all of it and see if it works. Okay, <laughs> it stopped working and uh, there is a visible difference in the behavior of that app. So let's continue. Let's uh, try to make it work. Apparently I have to move some stuff around and let's see now. Nope. <laughs> and there are still some differences and I'm fighting with it, maybe that way. All right. And now that the tests are passing, even though the code is totally different, it's a different kind of function. It's um, like in different moments of the source code, in different areas of the source code, 
it still passes because my tests are not concerned about how I write my code. They only tell me if my app works as I wanted it to work. So that was all when it comes to the video and we are going back to the slides now. All right, so what I achieved with that particular mix of Facebook Jest, Endpoint Imposter, Image Snapshot from American Express, can see that testing library was that I avoided all that tedious manual tests, but most importantly, I felt like I was alive creating new things because I wasn't repeating new tests over and over and over again. I was like writing it once, testing it once and leaving it behind. And I had to go back only when I broke something. And I actually remember this thing that I wouldn't discover otherwise, or maybe somebody would tell me, I was working on a front end dashboard with some data, some charts, and I did refactor red as a word, to a hex code for red, like FF0000. And I thought it was supposed to be the same. It always was the same, but that particular case was different. And for some reason, the charting library, which I used, decided to make it semi-transparent. I don't know why, I, I didn't expect it, but I got this uh, diff saying like, hey, this chart looks different. And I was like, what? And then I noticed like, oh, wow, that's semi-transparent. And I would never catch it. And I was so happy that I was able to just move fast, refactor stuff and work on the new things as much as I could really. But there was one more thing and I communicated better with product people. And I know you may be thinking like, what am I saying? How are tests going to make communication better? But people understand images. And it happens to me pretty often when I was asked to change something, to update some visuals, I would just do it roughly in the code. I would run my tests and of course they would fail because that app wasn't looking like that anymore. So I always had these screenshots for free for me. So when I had a screenshot like that, I would just send a Slack message to some person interested in that product and say, hey, look, is that okay? Is this what you want? On the left, uh, you have the old one. On the right, you have the new one. Do you want it to be like that for sure? And sometimes it was like, yeah, sure, do it. But sometimes it was, oh, you know what? Now when I see it, I think that maybe we should do something different. So I was like, of course we can do it. I was updating the CSS code, uh, running the tests again. I got another div, I sent it again. And that person was like accepting or rejecting. But finally we were able to get to what we both liked uh, or especially what the client liked. And what I loved about this experience was that People thought that I put some extra effort in preparing those special images for them, making the communication as instant as possible, as flawless and fluid. But the truth is that I was just posting the results of my test failures to them and telling them if it's okay or not. Like it cost me nothing. And I would even say that it, it saved me money. It allowed me to have more time, feel better, move faster. And it was a huge benefit for me, but also it made communication easier because nobody likes seeing code or divs like, hey, this function takes three parameters. Like, who cares? That's not something people are interested in. But when they say an image, especially with a div, that's super easy to see. Okay, that's the difference. Like or not and both answers are okay because it's cheap to redo it it's cheap to get it you can iterate over it so it helped me to communicate it better because users didn't see bugs they saw features and i was able to write features that way at least visual features 
And except for communication, it was also important that if you have a big app to write, and if it's a new app, probably you don't have any servers ready. So what can you do? You can wait, or you can use the mock because that mock is pretty realistic. So once you agree with some backend developers on the contract of the API, you can just write a mock that reflects this contract and you can develop against that mock. So you don't have to wait for the backend team to finish their work. You can just start working in parallel. And I did it many, many times. And I'm gonna be honest with you. Sometimes I had issues with adhering to the contract because sometimes we had some schemas enforced, like some Swagger, Open API, that kind of stuff. And sometimes we didn't. And when we didn't, sometimes the backend people did it one way, I did it another way, but usually it was like, what's the empty answer, like empty response, or is it capital letter or not? Details, and we could just you know, spot it immediately and fix it, or we could just use the schema and have it validated for us. So the gain of being able to write an entire front-end app before the API is ready, sometimes it was just the whole development time in half. So if you are working against some deadline, if you have very limited time to push it to production, it is a very handy option to be able to start working simultaneously on different parts of this project. And during the whole process, I felt pretty comfortable because I was able to use dev tools at any point in time, like even in between states. Like how is that app behaving when some data is being loaded? Well, I don't have to ask myself. I can just pause if it has, run it, open the dev tools, inspect it, see if there is something in the console or if I can click something, how it behaves. It is like supercharging the usual manual testing process. I'm just doing the same I would do otherwise, but I have this possibility to pause it at any point in time, to automate it. So I'm not like accumulating some testing debt. So to sum it up, there were like no limits because I was running it on my machine. It was free, no subscriptions. It was working offline. And I put it together for you, like a whole compilation of these tools, like a distribution of testing tools, which I used, which helped me to achieve what I have just shown you. And finally, I can do the same I did years ago. If the tests pass, I ship it. Now in the single page application edition. And it's all because it's standing on the shoulders of giants like Google Chrome, Selenium, testing library, Jest from Facebook, and so on. And now I believe it's all from me and time for your questions. I wrote one. Hi, Lucas. First of all, thanks. Super nice presentation. Um, I have a question um, related, related to the, the, the mock. I, of course, understand uh, the advantages of using this, but don't you think that it can also create at the same time um, false, uh, I mean, it can deviate from the real uh, APIs using mocks. This is not only for you in general, it's in general yes. using mocks. Yes, that's absolutely true. It can. And if you are able to achieve your goals without a mock, do it. It's always better because mocks are not what you're shipping. So if you have an API which you can control, or if you can work closely with the backend team, or if it's somehow super cheap to restart it and so on, or if it's very easy to create some data there, totally. Because if you are creating another implementation, because a mock is another implementation, you are creating two clients, two implementations, two things that should follow the same interface should follow the same schema, but they don't necessarily have to. And sometimes it is very hard to compare them because you can do some API schemas and they worked well for me, but still 
you don't exactly know what the real server is going to return. And there are some limits to static types. Sometimes you have to run it. And the only thing you can really run and you can absolutely be sure it's the right thing is the real thing. So yeah, for me, I wasn't in a position where I had a backend or that backend was easy to control. But I was able to get the decent results. Of course, I had to communicate with people responsible for this backend. If I could bypass it, if I could avoid mocking, I would totally do it. And it's always better to start with that thing in mind that maybe you don't have to mock. Just usually when I do my single page applications, I have to mock, but of course you have to first ask yourself, what is your problem? What is the challenge you're facing? And then use the right tool. Thanks, yeah, yeah, clear. And the other question, just out of curiosity, you, you in the code, you mentioned a function called EI use. Can you tell us what EI means, please? Oh uh, yeah, it's uh, just for endpoint imposter and it's configuring the app to hit mm. the mock server and not the real API. Okay, okay, thanks. Hey, I also have a question. Uh, thanks for the talk, very interesting. Uh, so when you're doing a um, screenshot comparison, uh, are you expecting always a pixel perfect or is there like some kind of threshold for very, very small changes that are just, I don't know, rendering magic or something like, um, how is yes. this handled <clears throat> with small changes? Yeah. That's a great question. And you have to some, um, you have to have some bar set probably very high. You might need to aim for like 99% of uh, match, but there will be some differences, especially around fonts. And usually when you update your web browser, it's better to you know keep your app in the safe state, run the tests, update it, and only then work on your app because even updating the web browser is going to change some details about colors or shadows, that kind of stuff. So if you compare absolutely every pixel with every pixel, there are going to be differences. Fortunately, that library by American Express, which is actually using some library by Mapbox, the company behind some nice custom maps, it has some really smart algorithms that deal with little blurs, some noise, so you can find the right parameters and tune it for your app, depending on how many visual effects you have, how big are the elements, or how big is the screen, and so on. Thank you. Um, I would have another one. Anyone else? Okay. Um, how do you handle working in a team with like screenshots and stuff like that? So you, you just mm -hmm. check them into version control like any other code or are they like um, stored separately or how do, how do they move between developers basically? Mm -hmm. With that kind of tooling, I'm usually working with either a very small team or alone. And that matters. It is important to mention that. So thank you for asking me that because it might become a problem. For example, if I had a very large team or if I wanted to do some open source project uh, and I didn't know absolutely anything about the people who are going to touch it, I would certainly avoid running it on my machine. I would probably go for some uh, browser stack or a similar service because there I can expect some consistent results. And here, I basically assumed that the developers are going to have the most uh, modern updated version of either like Mac, Windows, or some Ubuntu with uh, the newest Chrome and so on. So that's already three, uh, just three groups. And then I grouped them by the operating system because the truth is you are not going to get the same results if you don't run it in uh, some virtual machine or so on. And I experimented with virtual machines. It was interesting, but I was losing too much of that local advantage. 
So I wanted to focus on small teams that are using either similar or very similar machines. And that way I could use the dev tools in a way that's completely native. So I had this nice direct feeling because otherwise I could just use browser stack, which would be great in solving that problem, which just I didn't have if I was able to have a limited diversity of browsers and machines. And there is actually a workflow you can use, uh, let's say between Mac and Windows. So you just have to have a habit that if you check in uh, some code, you assume it's good. If you check out that code from a repository, you assume it's good. You run the test. And if something is different, well, it means somebody updated it. And you just have to trust that other person. And only then you can do some changes. So you cannot do changes unless they are passing. So if you have a situation when you have very different machines and that kind of local workflow, you have to rely on trust, which of course can fail, but you have that benefit of having it locally. If you cannot rely on it, then it's a good idea to have some sort of somebody else machine, either in the cloud or maybe in the office, whatever works for you, you can just run it remotely. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Aurelian asked about um, basically keeping data up to date when uh, using mocks. And what I liked about your uh, approach was that you basically had a small uh, introductory mock and then you actually interacted with it like a, like a real server. And um, I, I assume that also uh, gives you some more um, confidence in that your data is up to date since Basically, you're using it very similar to how the actual user will interact with it. Yeah, so it is true that you can actually uh, create some mocks and then the backend can change, like the real API can change. So in that kind of situation, you are either on a small enough team that you know about it, or maybe you are writing the backend, or again, you have to use some technical solution. And in that case, probably a schema is enough. So you can, because this mock is a real server, your real API is also a real server, and you can put some real proxy in between. So both like your backend and your mocks can go through that schema if you want to have some automation around it and catch up that kind of updates. But usually when that API is updating, you will also get some notification or you should get a notification that uh, something is a breaking change if you are a client of this API. So then you know that you have to update your app. And if you're updating your app through the tests, you're also updating the mocks because you want to test it. Yep, very nice. Thank you very much. Any other questions? No, probably for the current moment not. But anyway, so if you have any questions also after the session, you can just post it in the Slack channel and Lukas will answer it as soon as he can, yeah. So thank you, thank you, Lukas, for being here and sharing your knowledge. So I would start with a wrap-up session. Could you please stop sharing your screen? Of course. So. I think you can see all my screen. So Lukas, if you have any other topics and you want to be here again, you're always welcome. Just contact us. So what, thank you very much. So what else? Um, video recording of this session, you can find it, I think, from at least until end of this year uh, on the YouTube. Uh, please check our website. We will try to do it next week. But uh, yeah, as I told, at least until this year, just check the website and you'll find the video recording of this session. Uh, what's coming next? Uh, so this session was the last session of this year. The next time we will meet in next year, January 18. We have already two talks from Andre uh, Soltsnev about Selenite and from Vitaly uh, Sharavatov about worst advice on team design test steps to decreasing quality. So hope to see you there. 
thank you all um, and have a Merry Christmas and have a Happy New Year. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.